So today we'll be talking about context-free grammars uh, again. So last time we introduced the concept of a context-free grammar and we went through some examples. <coughs> so what does context-free mean? <coughs> what does context-free mean? Yeah, exactly. So you can have only one variable on the left-hand side. And this is the only kind of grammars that we will, uh, uh, we will cover in this course. So this is context-free. If you have something like AS, this is not context-free. This is context-sensitive, and this is the kind of grammars that we will not be covering in this course. Okay, so the example that we were looking at last time was the language L, W such that NA of W equals NB of W. And we looked at this grammar for this language. Or epsilon. Now, in order to show that a grammar indeed generates a language, or that you know, the language of this grammar is indeed this language, you need to show that every, every string generated by G, let's call it grammar G. So this is, let's call this grammar grammar G. Every string generated by G belongs to L and that every what? So in order to show that this <coughs> grammar generates the language, we need to show that every string that is generated by G belongs to L and that every string that belongs to L is generated by G. Are these the same thing? Two statements, totally different. So showing that every string generated by G belongs to L, is it easy or hard? This is very easy. There is no way that you can generate a string here that doesn't have an equal number of A's and B's. There is no way to put more A's than B's or more B's than A's. Because you will have to use one of these rules. So you have rule one, rule two, rule three, rule four. And none of these rules you know, can put more A's than B's. So these are the two rules that will add A's and B's to the string. What does this rule do? It, what does it do? It splits the path into two branches. Well, in fact, think of it in terms of generation, not in terms of analysis. So you're thinking of, of it in terms of analyzing a string. So not analyzing a string, we're generating a string in terms of construction, not analysis. In terms of construction, what does this do? Or generation? What's that? It, so, yeah, so what's the relation here between S and S? So we're concatenating two strings that belong to the language. So we're concatenating two strings that belong to the, so we're saying that, you know, this S can be the concatenation of two S's that belong to the language. And, you know, we can keep doing this forever. But obviously this will not, uh, this will not generate an actual string. In order to generate an actual string, we will have to use these rules. You know, uh, or if we want to generate the empty string so we can substitute epsilon for all of them, and then we'll get an, the empty string. But in order to get a string that has A's and B's in it, we'll have to use one of these two. 
so this concatenates two strings that got generated by the you know by other rules so here you know we can do asb we can do asb again we can do bs a and so forth now so it's very obvious that every string generated by this language belongs to l now to argue that every string that belongs to L is generated by G, or that this grammar covers all the strings that have an equal number of A's and B's. So did anyone try to come up with a string that has an equal number of A's and B's, but cannot be generated using this grammar? Yeah. In fact, we will not give a formal proof for this. We'll just give a, uh, you know, a, a logical argument, a convincing argument that uh, there is no way uh, or there is no string that belongs to the language that does not get generated by this grammar or that this grammar is general enough to cover all the strings that have an equal number of A's and B's. So, so let's consider the following you know, analysis of uh, the strings that belong to the language. So a string that belongs to the language, you can think of them as three kinds of strings either starts with <coughs> a and ends with b b so if it starts with a and ends with b so what should you have between a and b so the string, what, what can you say about the string or the substring between the A and the B? Epsilon star. Okay, okay. What, what, no, no, you cannot put anything here. What can you say about the W that should be between, that can be between A and B in this case? Yeah. It also belongs to the language. Yeah, it also belongs to the language. So in fact, this is, yeah, uh, this is in fact, uh, you know, you're showing the recursion and th this is in fact uh, uh, you know, a proof by induction or you can turn this into a proof by induction that the strings that this will generate the strings that start with A and B uh, that start with A and end with B so everything that st starts with A and ends with B should have in the middle between the A and the B something that has an equal number of A's and B's because here you have one A and one B if you have something here that has more A's uh, than B's or more B's than A's the overall string is not belong to the language. It's not going to belong to the language. Similarly, if you have uh, a string that starts with uh, B and ends with A, then same logic. This should have uh, between the B and the A. It should have a uh, a string that belongs to the language. So. A, W, B such that W belongs to L, W belongs to L. Now what about the string that starts and ends with the same symbol? Of course our sigma here is A, B, which is obvious. Now, if it starts and ends with the same symbol, uh, like something A, then W, A. Now, what can you say about the W between the A and the A? Can you say that this W will have an equal number of A's and B's? Of course not. In fact, this W should have two more B's, right? In order for this whole string to belong to the language, this W should have two more B's. But in fact, you know, how do we justify using this rule? The idea is that any string of this form must be of the form, uh, you know, S1, S2, such that S1 and S2 belong to the language. S1 belongs to L and S2 belongs to L. Why? So any string 
that starts with an A and ends with an A can be split or can be divided, not split, uh, can be divided into two strings such that you know, each one of them has an equal number of A's and B's. Why? Because think about it this way. If let's, let's look at a string like uh, you know, a string that starts with an A and ends with an A. So like uh, A, A, B, B, uh, A, A, B, B, then B, A. So this is a string that belongs to the language, but it cannot be generated using this rule or this rule, right? Because it starts with an A and ends with an A. So we cannot generate it using rule one. We cannot generate it using rule two, but if we think of, if we keep the count of A's and the count of B's, or the count of A's, uh, the, let's say the count of uh, excessive A's, how many more A's than B's do we have? If we keep counting, we'll say, okay, here I have, this counter is going to say I have one more A. Now I have two more A's. So, so far the count is I have two A's but zero B's, so I have two more A's than B's. But now when I get to this B, what should the counter be? Mm. One. Then here, zero. Here, it will go to minus one. Because I have now three more, uh, one more B's than A's. Uh, and this will bring it to zero. So now, <coughs> this is for this example. Now for what, what does this mean? What does it prove? It proves that every string that starts with an A and ends with an A and belongs to the language can be divided into two strings that, uh, uh, so that such that each one of them belongs to the language. So why? B because if you, if you look at a general string, so here I have a, an A, and then I have something and another A. Now I know that, you know, thinking in those counts, I know that here the count is going to be one. And what must the count be here in order for the string to belong to the language? Zero. I know that the count here is zero. Okay. So now, this here, in this location, what was the count here? What was the count? It must be... No, there is a unique number. It must be a specific number. What should the count here be before the A? Negative? Negative one. Why negative one? Because something, this A added a 1, so it's like x plus 1 equals 0, right? What's x? x is minus 1. So this value here must be minus 1. Now, you have this, uh, <coughs> uh, this function that goes from 1 and ends at minus 1. What can you say about this? If it goes from 1 and it ends at minus 1, what can you say will happen somewhere in the, somewhere in the middle? Hmm? It will reach 0 somewhere. It must, there is no way to go from 1 to minus 1 without going through a 0. So there has to be a 0 somewhere. We don't know where. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be in the middle. It, doesn't, it could be closer to the minus 1. It could be closer to the 1. But there has to be a 0 somewhere. <coughs> and what does this zero tell us? It tells us that this string must consist of two strings. So whenever we get a zero, we have a string that belongs to the language. So the other zero will give us another string that belongs to the language. So <coughs> OK, so this, this argument just shows that you know, the logic behind this rule, SS, so that to cover all the strings that 
start and end with the same symbol. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't only cover all the strings that uh, you know, start and end with the same symbol. It just it allows you to concatenate strings that, uh, that come from this rule or this rule. Or in fact, you can, it can concatenate strings that, uh, that come from this rule as well. Okay, so this is not a formal proof, but it should be, it should convince you that we are covering all the strings that uh, belong to the language, and try to come up with a string that we cannot derive. Yes? So if you have epsilon, would you have to number epsilon too, or you just omit? There would be no epsilon in an actual string, right? An actual string will not have an epsilon in it. Epsilon by itself is a string that does not have any symbols in it. So basically, with an epsilon, we start with zero and end with zero, and it will never go to one or uh, minus one. So the epsilon, so you cannot have, the epsilon is not a symbol that can appear within a string. This, the epsilon is a symbol that represents the empty string. Yes? Is there more? Right, yes, so this, uh, that's a good point. So what we have argued shows that there should be at least one zero, but there can be multiple zeros. Yeah, so th th that's, a, that's a good point. Okay, so, <coughs> you know, this string here, uh, this uh, grammar, let's, uh, there is more that we uh, would like to say about this uh, grammar. So there are, uh, well, first of all, With this grammar, there can be multiple ways of deriving uh, the same string. So, like, uh, you know, the string, say, A, B, B, A. So, you can derive this in two different ways. I can show you two different derivations of this. One derivation is that it's an S and an S, where, you know, this is the first S and this is the other S. Or l let's make it more interesting, uh, a more interesting example. Uh, the one that I just had, A, B, B, uh, so, uh, A, 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 B, B, uh, B, A, this one. So, this one will, uh, you can view it as, this is an S and this is another S. And you can derive it. So, this is going to be A, S, B, and then, yeah, A, S, B, and then another A, S, B. And then I put an epsilon. So this way I derive this left hand side S. And for this other S, I do B, S, A, and then I put an epsilon. So this is one derivation, but I can derive it this way instead. I can say, okay, S is SS. But I can set this S to epsilon. I can substitute epsilon for this. And then this S will have the actual string. So this will be an SS. And this will be just, uh, you know, this. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to repeat it. So this S is going to be this whole thing. Right? So you can say, uh, this is, I can set, this is just another alternative. So what am I trying to show here? That there can be multiple derivations for the same string. And when there are multiple derivations for the same string, we call this grammar an ambiguous grammar. So this is an ambiguous grammar. So an ambiguous grammar, 
uh, a grammar uh, for which at least one string has more than one derivation. <coughs> and speaking of derivations, we have, we should be aware of the notion of leftmost derivation and rightmost derivation. Leftmost. Now, leftmost derivations and rightmost derivations. Uh, okay, so for any derivation that you can do with a with a tree, with a derivation tree, you can do it in a leftmost manner or a rightmost manner using the textual derivation. So I will show you the leftmost derivation for this string. So I will start with S. Then I will substitute by rule, uh, by, uh, I, will, I will substitute by rule 3, and I get an SS. So this is rule 3, gives me SS. Now, in a leftmost derivation, you always substitute for the leftmost symbol first. So here, you substitute for this S, ASB, by rule uh, by rule 1, I do ASB, then S. Then I substitute for the leftmost symbol again. By rule 1, I do AASBB. -B. Uh, and then I still have the S. Then with the leftmost logic, what should I substitute? Epsilon for the S. So using rule number four, I substitute epsilon for the S. So I will get A, A, B, B, S. Then, by rule, so now I'm done with the leftmost, with the left-hand branch. So leftmost derivation is going to do the left first, then the right, in a depth first manner. Then I will do this. So this S is this S. This S here is this S. So I'm going to do by rule number two, I'm going to do B S A. And then my final substitution. Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot the rest of the string. So it's, uh, I keep this A A B B. And then I substitute for this S a B A. Uh, uh, B, sorry, BSA. You shouldn't skip any steps. BSA. We should not skip any step. So this gives us this. And finally, by rule uh, 4, I do AA, B, 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 A. Okay. So step by step. We shouldn't skip any uh, step. So this is a leftmost derivation. Now let me do a rightmost derivation for the same string. Let's see what the rightmost derivation. So we're going to do a rightmost derivation for the same tree. <coughs> so the rightmost derivation is not a unique <coughs> de uh, derivation. It's not distinct from the leftmost. So the same derivation, you can do it left to right or right to left. So forget about this other derivation. <coughs> so this can you do, you can do it right to left as well. So you can do S by rule three, you get SS. Now you substitute for the right first. So what do I substitute for the right? B, S, sorry, first the left, then I substitute for the right, B, S, A. Which rule did I use? Rule number two. 
So here I started with rule not one, here I started with rule two. Then I substitute what? For which S should I substitute next? The rightmost S. The rightmost S is, is, is this, so I substitute an epsilon. So it's going to be S B A by rule four. S, uh, yeah, S B A by uh, rule four. Then I ex expand this S using rule number one. By rule number one, I do A S B B A. Then by rule one again, I do A A S B B B A. Well, let me make it clearer. Uh, then this is A A S B B B A by rule number one. Then which rule do I use? Yeah, the rule for the epsilon, which is rule number four. I do A A B B B A. Okay, so this is the rightmost derivation. So the leftmost and the rightmost derivation, th they are just two different ways of doing the same derivation. So they don't count as two derivations. They count as one derivation. So in fact, in every, uh, in every language that has multiple symbol on the right-hand side, you will always have a leftmost derivation and a rightmost derivation. And having a leftmost derivation and a rightmost derivation doesn't mean that the language or the, the grammar is ambiguous. Okay. So having a leftmost and a rightmost doesn't mean that the grammar is ambiguous. The grammar will be ambiguous if you can come up with two actually different derivations, like two different derivation trees. Like this grammar, you know, we came up with this derivation with a different derivation tree, which is this. So this is a, a, a fundamentally different. So this makes it ambiguous. Okay, so are we clear on the concept of leftmost, rightmost? and ambiguous. Uh, one more thing that we need to know about this grammar is that this grammar is, is not a linear grammar. This grammar is not linear because we have multiple S's on the right hand side. So a linear grammar is a grammar in which there can be at most one symbol on the right hand side of every rule. Okay, so let me define a linear grammar. A linear grammar is a grammar in which there is at most one variable one variable oh did i say symbol i i meant variable at least one at most one variable on the right hand side <coughs> there is at most one variable on the right hand side of any uh, production. In other words, if you have a production in which there are multiple variables on the right hand side, then it's a nonlinear grammar. Okay, so here, because we have this rule with multiple variables on the right hand side, this is a nonlinear grammar. Now, uh, 
Okay, so there is the notion of uh, left linear or right linear. So a left linear grammar is a grammar in which every production is of the form x um, a1 sorry this is uh, x uh, y a1 a2 a3 through a n or <coughs> x or the form or x is a one a two a three a m so if in your grammar every production either has one variable that appears on the left hand side, the leftmost variable, the leftmost symbol is a variable followed by terminals. So these are terminals. A1, so these are terminals. And these are terminals. So every production either doesn't have any variables on the right hand side, so it's either completely terminals or it has a, a variable that appears uh, on the left hand side so th this is if a grammar is like this then it's a right a left linear grammar of course a right linear grammar is a grammar in which every production is of the form x a1 a2 through a n y and or x uh, a1 a2 through a m so a right linear grammar is a grammar in which there is only one variable on the right hand side and this variable appears consistently uh, in the rightmost position or as the rightmost symbol in every production now why are these uh, left linear and right linear grammars uh, interesting they are interesting because if a grammar is right linear or left linear it's a regular grammar and calling it a regular grammar is not a coincidence in fact we call it a regular grammar because it will be equivalent to an nfa or a dfa or a regular expression and we will uh, you know in the in fact in the next lecture we'll see a systematic procedure for converting a regular grammar into a finite automaton so, if a grammar or, well, we can define it, a regular grammar <coughs> a regular grammar is a, a grammar that is left linear or right linear <coughs> well so we need an example uh, you know today we will not go will not get the chance to go through the systematic procedure for converting a regular grammar into an, an NFA or a DFA but we will go through an example that will show us uh, you know the relations that, or that we can you know, always uh, come up with a regular grammar for a regular language. So let's uh, let's look at this language W such that W starts with the prefix uh, AB. 
Now, is this linear? Uh, uh, sorry, is this a regular language? Of course, it's a regular language. We, you know, we know how to construct an NFA or a DFA or a regular expression for this. So a regular expression for this is what? Just AB what? Sigma star. So this is very easy. We know that it's regular. How do we construct a grammar for this language? Well, we can do this. We can say S is A, B, X. Now, what should the X now generate? What should it generate? It should generate sigma star. It should generate, it should generate any string. And how do we write a grammar for sigma star? How do we write a grammar that will generate any string? A, or X. Okay, A, X, or B, X, or, B, X, or epsilon. This can generate anything, right? This can generate sigma star. So this generates sigma star. Right, so let's, let's convince ourselves that it generates sigma star. Here's an x. What do I, I, I put, you know, ax. If I want a b, I just do a bx. If I want an a, I do an ax. If I want a b, I do a bx. So I, you can do, you can generate any string. So this can generate any string that belongs to this, uh, to the sigma star of this alphabet. Of course, here our alphabet is implicitly or I didn't mention that it's a b. <coughs> okay, so is this grammar linear? Yeah, it's linear and it's more than linear. It's uh, is it right linear or left linear? Right linear. So if a grammar is strictly right linear, it's a regular grammar. But in fact, I can make it. So this is right linear. and regular. So right linear, by definition, if it's right lin linear, then it's regular. And as we will see next time, we can take any regular grammar and convert it into uh, a finite automaton. There is a, a simple systematic procedure for converting any uh, regular grammar into a finite automaton. But the point here, the, the subtlety here, is that <coughs> I can turn this grammar into a grammar that is not regular. So if I just do this, uh, if I um, if I change this to x b, then it will still generate sigma star, right? So x, or I can generate, I can change both of them, x b. To make it so x a sorry to make it simpler, if, uh, if I change it to from a x to x a to x b now is this first of all is this grammar does this satisfy the definition of a regular grammar? Yes. No, it doesn't. Is this right linear or left linear? It's mixed. It's not right linear or left linear. So it's a mixed linear. It's not right. It's not strictly right linear. It's not strictly left linear because this. Production is has the variable on the right. These productions have the variable on the left. Okay. So it's not right linear or left linear, but it can still generate the same thing because here, you know, x, uh, you can do, uh, you know, x a. You can do, uh, sorry, x a, and you can do. So it will grow in the other direction. Yeah. Th then you can do x b uh, or X A, whatever. So you can generate sigma star. Yes. So there's mixed linear and non-regular. Yeah, but the subtlety is, this is a non-regular grammar, but it doesn't make the language non-regular. So a regular language. Okay. So now let me ask you this. This is a, a non-regular, a non-regular grammar that generates a regular language. 
So now, how would you define a regular language in terms of grammars? What's the precise definition of a regular language in terms of grammars? What? So how would you define it? So you cannot say that it's a language that's generated uh, only by regular grammars, right? You can say that a language is regular if there exists at least one regular grammar that generates it. Okay, so if you can find one regular grammar that generates a language, then it's a regular language, even if it has many non-regular grammars that generate it. So in order for the language to be regular, it doesn't have to be, not all the grammars that generated, generate it have to be linear, uh, uh, regular. So a language is regular if there exists at least one regular grammar that generates it. In fact, I can make these I can come up with an equivalent grammar here <coughs> that is not even linear. Can you, can you turn this grammar? You know, can you easily come up with a, with a non-linear grammar that is equivalent to this linear grammar? Yes, what, what's that? I would be able to take the x rule and I would take the a-X and the B-X, and I'll combine that into one rule where you have like a uh, Z-X. So are you talking about this? Yeah, and then the Z would be any symbol. Uh, okay, that, that's, okay, that's one way of doing it, yeah. So let's, uh, yeah, so it's, it was A-X. Uh, so you're suggesting Z-X, right? Yeah. Or Epsilon. Uh, why didn't you say why? Why did you skip why? <laughs> no, just kidding. It, you can use any symbol. Okay. Uh, so it's ZX where Z is A or B. Yeah. This is a way of making this grammar nonlinear. So this is a nonlinear. So this grammar is not even linear. But it didn't change the language. The language is still the same. So as I said, if a language is regular, if there exists at least one regular grammar that generates it. And in fact, I could have made this a variable. So I could have changed this a, b. Now I can use y. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's available for me to use. And then I can put a, b. Right? So I can make it more nonlinear. <laughs> if there is such a thing. I don't think there is a such a thing. There is no more nonlinear or less nonlinear. <laughs> it's either linear or nonlinear. Okay. Yeah. But it's, you know, this is the idea. The idea, the subtlety is <coughs> a language is regular if you can find at least one regular grammar that generates it. Okay. Finally, any questions? So this relation between, you know, grammars and finite automata, I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, I, will, I don't need to erase this because I will not have the time to use this. Um, so, what about this grammar? <coughs> so, what does this generate? So what can you say about the strings that are generated? Of course, the strings that are generated by this grammar, this language is going to be a sub-language of the language of uh, strings that have an equal number of A's and B's. So this language here, uh, so this is no longer this. So this language, you know, the set of strings generated here is a subset of the set of strings that are generated by the previous grammar that we had before with the other production, with the, you know, the language of equal A's and B's. 
So this is a subset of it. So in, in addition to having an equal number of A's and B's, what can you say about the string that gets generated by this language? Okay, it starts with an A and ends with a B. And it's more than that. In fact, if you replace A and B, if you replace sigma with this, with these two symbols, okay, so what will this generate? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. It will generate balanced pa uh, parentheses. It will generate the set of all balanced uh, sequences of parentheses. So L is going to be W such that W is a balanced or a sequence. Oh, in fact, a balanced sequence of parentheses. So here, you know, basically it's saying that you cannot have, you cannot open, have open parentheses without having closed. So everything that you open, you must close it. So here, you know, I can derive, so let's try to derive this. Trying to derive this, I have an S and an S. And what's the first S? This is the first S. And this is the second S. And the first S is going to be open parentheses S, close parentheses. And then I do it again. Open S, close parentheses. And what should this S be? Epsilon. And then this S is another open S close epsilon. So when we removed that other uh, production, this grammar generates uh, the set of uh, the set of balanced sequences of parentheses, where you know you can't open parentheses without closing them. For every open, there is a close. Any questions on this?